gotta have faith when you wake up. Boy Scouts is 11 to 15 or 16, uh, and there was a period of time when he and I were in Troop 538 together. His father was the scoutmaster, and, uh, and so I remember Mike uh, from from those days uh, as you know, a kid that we went went camping with and had a good time with and played games with it. And stuff like that. I didn't really know Mike until Cub Scouts, and we just we just had a ball, and then Cub Scouts was where it was at. Mrs. Baker was the uh, the, the den leader. As we get into Scouts more and more, uh, the four of us, uh, Scott Edmonds and Don and I and Mike, really enjoyed being uh, together. Just, these are things we do. Uh, weekly days got together, but then we kind of took it seriously. I know Michael, Mike Baker and I were like real serious, like we do a good turn deal. Like we should do that. I mean, we should really do that. So the first snow of the winter, we all get together and grab a shovel. So let's go down the street and start shoveling. Yeah, I guess I'm the oddball here because I didn't really get to be good friends with Mike till late high school probably more post high school, you know, I mean, we knew who each other was and everything in school, but we just never, and I can't really remember what was going on if we started spending more time together, but it didn't take long until we were doing stuff together all the time. Well, I was working, I think up at Bucknell at the time in the bookstore, mm -hmm. and his aunt worked up there, mm -hmm. and uh, he was going to Bucknell at that mm -hmm. time, and he would come in, his aunt always thought that he and I would, you know, make a good pair. So every time, every time he would come into the bookstore, she would like buzz me. And I was in the <laughs> office, she would buzz me to come back to her department or something like that. Oh, it was, it was funny. Definitely there was, um, you know, a, a friendship there, you know, and an attraction in, in mm -hmm. some certain way. I'm heading back to me is uh, just going to get a chiropractor. Oh, ah, really? There's a, uh, Add in a paper if someone wanted to uh, find a good home for a Labrador Retriever. You know, I had one lab at the time, I liked them a lot, and figured I'd see if it seemed like someone from Mike's uh, trailer behind Eden Hospital with him and uh, see who lived at the time. And they had this yellow lab named Summer, who was about five years old, and uh, they were happy with me, and I was happy with Summer. I was walking into the bookstore at the time, and I heard this, you know, Sue, Sue, you know, and I'm like, ah, I was like, uh, I was like, oh my God, I had this like bandana scarf on my head, because I looked as like, oh my Baker, oh, oh my God, and so I'm like weaving and trying to get out of the way, I'm like, oh my God, no, not now, but he followed me out of the bookstore, and you know, we started talking, like, and it was easy, I mean, like it always has been. I you know, he says to me, he goes, well, you know, what are you doing tomorrow? And, you know, so I don't know, I said, if you even remember, you know, yeah. tomorrow, we'll see, you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> First thing, he called me, you know, the next day, we went out on a date, and we were never apart since. Yeah. Six months to the day of which um, we went out. He asked me to marry him. Actually, I had seen Mike uh, a couple different times because I kept blowing my back out and my neck out <laughs> because I am the ultimate stubborn musician and then I don't want any help and then I can lug everything myself. He, they came over and brought the girls over for classes oh. and the girls started Taekwondo first and then Mike and Sue sort of said, hey, well, that looks like it'd be fun and then they came and started. I met him, I think it was either in 96 or 97 at Greeks Taekwondo. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, at the time, our son Aaron and later our daughter Kaya started Taekwondo, and that's when I met Mike and Sue. Mm -hmm. My more direct connection was through my wife Barb, who, uh, you know, I would see Mike periodically over the years, but Barb became his patient. It was, they were always fun to be around. We did a lot of different things besides Taekwondo, one on wine tours, and stuff like that. I heard that Mike Baker had a brain tumor on New Year's Eve. And of course my first reaction was, it can't be anything serious. I'm sure that it's benign. And as the days went by, we learned that 
In fact, he had inoperable brain cancer. A part of me, like, just, I mean, I knew he was sick. There, I guess there's a part of me that was in denial that, and just thought because he's such a positive person that he's going to, like, somehow pull out of this, yeah, you know. Yeah, too. <laughs> um, he did go really quick, and I think we were all pretty surprised because um, we were hoping that he would rebound and come back, but um, we're only here for a temporary time anyway, so. I was struck with this overwhelming feeling that I needed to do something, but I didn't know what I needed to do. I think there's so many different creative ways out there to help somebody, whether it's picking up groceries. Hey, we're thinking about you. Is there anything we can do? Like there were a couple of times going to the store, you know, and there were some times that we would just maybe drop some things off, but just that kind of walk that line between being supportive but not being too intrusive, you know? Just speaking for me, I know as a musician, I never have tons and tons of money. I wish I did, but I don't. What I do have is a spirit of, of music and a camaraderie, and I think our friends do. And I thought, if nothing else, we could rally the spirit to get up and get people out there who do have the funds, maybe, that could come and add even more to our pile than what we could. And I saw my friend KJ, Riemann Snyder Wagner, and I told her of Mike's plight, and she knows Mike. And she said, oh my gosh, what can we do? She, she sort of had that same feeling that I did of, of urgency. And I said, I don't know. I organized the Michael P. Baker uh, Medical Fund. And so being the musician and the uh, PR person that KJ is, she thought of doing this concert for Mike Baker. It's those little things that people don't think of doing. Mm -hmm. They're not monumental things, but together they're monumental. It's one piece at a time, and a lot of people are afraid to enter something because they're thinking it's too overwhelming. Right. It's, it can be if, it's, if you look at too big of a picture, but if you break it down into person by person, I mean, look at all these people, amazing people, and we all want to do something. You just call out my name you know wherever I am I'll come running to see you again winter spring summer or fall all you gotta do is call and I'll be there yes I will you've got a friend of this concert is really twofold. Of course, the primary reason we're here is to try to raise money for Mike's treatment. But really, the other reason for the concert is for us to come together as a community. You know, whether you live in Lewisburg or nearby, I think it's really important that we come together in our hearts and in our minds and send healing thoughts and love to Mike and his family. That's always a good feeling in, in any gathering, in any community, when you share a common purpose and a common hope. Uh, that's always a good feeling. And it was there, uh, it was richly there on that day. You gotta have faith in the road less traveled. You gotta have faith but I think even more important than the money that we raised was the feeling in that room that day of compassion and love and support for Mike and Sue and the Baker family and the feeling that this community wanted to come together to help them in their time of need. You gotta have faith, you got to make it. No, everybody's bound to get the blues sometimes. This old world can show sure get out of hand. But you got to dig right down and look within. And give yourself a helping hand. You got to have faith in the wisdom of your father. Gotta have faith in the tunnel. You, gotta have you always made me laugh. That was one thing. I always
always loved his laugh. If you were down and out, had the blues about anything, all you do is go spend a little time with Mike. And if you weren't walking away with a smile on your face, you definitely felt better. That's Mike's gift. He was genuinely interested in people. You know, and he had this aura about him that when you talked to him, anybody talked to him, you could feel it. And you, you knew he was listening. You knew he was interested. And he just radiated. And, and, and that's what drew people to him. He was just a real genuine person. Just their personalities to, to bring people together, to celebrate life events like that. He loved the whole, you know, working with people, you know, healing, trying to help people and stuff like that. I mean, that just definitely was his calling. And he'd say at the very end, but I know you're going to continue to do the same thing next time. I said, yeah, pretty much. He said, so these are the exercises that you can do when you're not here. And I, I, as I mentioned that day, I was more impressed with him being that kind of doctor. He was not the kind of doctor that would say, I'll come back week after week after week after week. The patients who couldn't make it into the office to visit him, he would go to their homes to care for them. And um, also, when people couldn't pay, he would say, don't worry about it or, you know, give it to me when you can. We're out to help people. Mm -hmm. uh, scouting to us was, how do you help? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it followed us you know, mm -hmm. all through That's life. That's interesting. <laughs> but Mike, you know, he was just so easygoing. I mean, mm -hmm. he was the most easygoing person. Oh, well, you know, well, we gotta, gotta do, we gotta, nothing rattles him. Just, yeah. we're, we're, going, we're doing it. He tried to make it someplace that people were comfortable, mm -hmm. that the way he would want it, you know. So. Mm -hmm. That when they walked in, that it was, um, you know, right away that, you know, they felt that, uh, felt that comfort and that um, he would try to do what he could. He was so contagious with his, um, his energy, his thoughtfulness. Um, I just Very, very good. His, his thing was uh, personal contact and uh, caring about the people who, uh, he, who he worked with. For months, his sign out front was hanging by one screw at a 45 degree angle, and it bothered me. <laughs> but I didn't know what to do because they lived there, because I kept thinking, that'd be a simple to fix. So one weekend, he mentioned he was going away, so my wife and I snuck in with my cordless screwdriver and a screw, oh. and we just hung it back up. And I thought, well, we'll see if he, if he notices that, even, yeah. you know, or of course he wouldn't know who did it. So different drum circles, I'm not sure what they're, they do with theirs, but for us, we're practicing uh, ceremony songs. Right after he was diagnosed, we all, actually all made prayer tires and drummed that night for Mike, and I know they've been drumming off and on uh, for Mike and other people. We we'll make ties sometimes for people that are not feeling well and have them so in a prayer tie you take a pinch of tobacco then you put it into a piece of cloth and you tie that in a string and there's a series of those prayers put together. So, so when you ask a prayer, you put a prayer in there, you ask for what's best for the person. A lot of times you could get, I want, I want, I want, but you really ask what's best for the person. You know, his spirit will live on with us and we will think of when we do things, we'll think about Mike and what he would do if he was here. And uh, so that's sort of part of being such a powerful force, life force, that you don't, you don't erase that just by dying. You'll, he'll be part of, of us for, forever. And we'll all meet again. So, just glad that we had the opportunity that we did have. Uh, so I didn't feel like I did anything more than what way less than Mike ever gave me and way less than he gave the community. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really what Mike was. I mean, he never really thought about himself, I don't think, in terms of financial things at all. He just gave, gave, gave until, until he had nothing left to give anymore, unfortunately. There's a story to tell here that goes way beyond Mike, but that his story kind of is a backdrop for revealing 
um, that sense of community, that sense of togetherness, friendship, love, all of those things that came together. People that were grew up in that Boy Scout mentality, that Lewisburg mentality, when you got to Philly, you, your friends in Philly didn't think like that. Right. You know, and so, but these friends had the same quality in terms of, you, if you talk to them, you sort of were talking to, to family and you, mm -hmm. you could bounce things off of them and you could sort of face the, the rest of the people as long as you had this support right. system, if you will. So right. that's what kept, in, kept us in touch or kept us friends and sort of core values that were the same yeah. and, and friendships and, you know, like as I said, it's like, like, like family. Michael was born and raised in this town. All his life he's loved living and working with the community, raising two amazing daughters and making a new friend whenever he can. Communities come together to help people like uh, that are hurting and uh, so sometimes it's just grocery money, pay the bills kind of thing. So mm -hmm. We knew that everybody had their role in something and it did make it a whole community effort. It wasn't, you know, just one person doing it all. It everybody had a role. His goal has always been to help others, mind, body, and spirit. To help educate people on health alternatives and health, <coughs> the paths to a healthier body, mind, and spirit. I think it's a reminder that you gotta work a little bit harder at a little less hard at work, you know, friends. So you kind of wonder who's got that plan and what does that plan mean? And it could mean that he's pulled us all together. And life never stops. Time doesn't stand still. There's no way to slow down this crazy old world, is it? When the sun drops Everybody says, you know, when something tragic happens to a family member that, um, you know, why them and whatever. Um, and I think the hardest part has been that it's not just me. Um, everybody else feels that. The fund is actually called the Michael P. Baker Community Impact Fund. It's overseen by the First Community Foundation Partnership in Williamsport. And when it's fully funded at $25,000, it will be able to award $1,000 a year to area families coping with catastrophic illness or circumstance. And the fund was really created for two reasons, um, to carry on the generous spirit of Mike Baker and to help families that are coping with what his family coped with when he was suddenly faced with a health emergency. The funds raised uh, through this fundraiser today will be the first that will be used to start the ball rolling to make sure we are able to raise $25,000. Uh, any help that people can provide is appreciated. We just hope that everything that we do will carry on the spirit of Mike Baker and his generosity for this community. We're honored to do this because it's furthering Mike out there in the spiritual world, and isn't that what he would love? I want to honor, I want to honor him because he was, he was a good person, but you know what? He's just a normal person. You know? I told the girls, like, don't, don't make him so, you know, so unattainable that you can't, you, you can't live up to something. I said, because he was just a normal guy that just led with his heart. When the sun drops, when God works His will, there's only a moment to dream, then the new day begins. The new day begins.
Don't let the grass grow above you when you rest. You've got one more day to get to where you're going. One more day to do your very best. Don't let the clouds ever block your sunshine. Don't let the sunshine blind you on your way. You may have years of tears behind you. Now you've got one more day One more day When you can hug your children Or your mother Or your sister Or your wife One more day When you can watch the grass grow One more day When you can live your life Don't let The cynics Tell you they know better Better yet Don't let them talk to you at all You've got one more day to prove that they know nothing One more day to make your final call Don't let your loved ones ever doubt your passion Don't let your passion ever start to fade Oh, I know how it feels to be frightened But right now you've got one more day one more day when you can hug your children Or your mother or your father or your wife One more day you can watch the sun rise One more day you can live your life Hallelujah, you've got one more day Hallelujah, you've got one more day Hallelujah got one more day Hallelujah, you've got one 